Hi there. Well, today I'm continuing on the theme of multi-axis turning. Not really sure I enjoy it a great deal. It requires too much thinking. I just prefer to get on with it. Uh, but anyway, I might have overthought this one, but I've got a piece of oak and I've uh, marked up uh, one centre position and another centre position. Uh, the intention, and I've also marked it down the side so that I could get the um, marks aligned along the axis of the cylinder. So I'm going to endeavour to turn uh, one of these as a tenon for a O'Donnell, small O'Donnell jaws, and the other as a mortise. And one is scalloped within the other. I'm not sure this is going to work out. Let's have a go. Right, first thing is to turn the offset center as a tenon, I think. Now that I've shaped the tenon to have a slight angle on it to match the small O'Donnell jaws, I've fitted them in the jaws and centred it up the other way round. As the aim is to uh, turn the um, stem of the bud vase uh, on the off centre and then remount it to turn the body later on. Uh, at this point I'm not completely sure how I'm going to re-chuck it, uh, but that'll emerge or not. So now that I've got it aligned using the tailstock centre, I realise that I need to pull that away. And the first thing I need to do is to drill a hole for the uh, small plastic insert that will hold the water for the bud vase. I'm going to take this steady because it is off centre and only held on a couple of millimetres of tenon in the O'Donnell jaws. So I measure up the piece and stick some tape on as a guide mark on the um, drill which I've started off with as about a 10mm drill and the Jacob Chuck and I'm going to drill that and then it's a 16mm approximately diameter hole for the uh, water pot and that will go in secondly with a forced a bit. Now that's done I'm going to reset uh, the Jacob Chuck with a 60mm forced a bit and drill the hole again. At this point I realised that the forced a bit wasn't long enough because it's just a cheap import set so I found a 16mm traditional spade tipped drill uh, and I'm just going to go in the last few millimetres with that. It's got a rather a long point on it but the base is deep enough so it doesn't matter if that goes in. I've seen some people who grind those tips off so that you can uh, use a spade drill without having such a long pilot hole. I think I might have to do that. 
The water container has got a plastic cap uh, and it's nice if that can sit down so it's pretty well flush with the top when you pop it in. So I'm just going to dress the inside of the hole very carefully now with uh, a small skew and um, possibly a spindle gouge just in order to get that little recess of half a millimeter down uh, the uh, inside of that drilled hole. So now I've got the inside trimmed out to fit the plastic uh, holder. I can now centre it up again using the tailstock and uh, get on with uh, turning down the outside diameter. I'm going to use a 3 8 bowl gouge uh, with careful bevel presentation because as you can see there's quite a lot of air in the cut and it's easy for the tool to bounce off. So what's important here is that in order to get a uh, parallel finish with the axis the ghost has to be turned away completely in the area that you're cutting. Uh, that's what you're looking at, the horizon, when you're doing this, you're not looking where the tool is, you've got to feel where the tool is and just look to cut that ghost out a little at a time. It's uh, quite hairy to start with because you've got a, a bouncing effect of the hit and miss of the wood, but you get there slowly. I'd forgot to mark where I wanted the base to be, um, which it, as it's spinning around it's quite easy to get disorientated, so I thought I'd do it now. It doesn't matter how accurate it is, it just gives me something to see in the ghost. As you reduce the cut and start to produce the whatever shape you fancy for the shaft of the bud vase, uh, you do have to watch your fingers uh, because you've got a bit of flying wood spinning around just near your knuckle. Uh, and also, again, good tool control, bevel control, making sure that you do not get the flute tangled in the off-centre turning. It gets exciting if you do. I swap to a spindle gouge at this point for the final refining cuts because it's a bit easier to get into the corners. Uh, you do need to get it dressed neatly uh, at that changeover from the one diameter to the other diameter. I think I'm going to do a bit of detailing on the column. Uh, I've started to think this off centre piece might look like a sort of Cornish. Um, engine, a tin mine engine sitting on the edge of a cliff. So I think I'm going to make a sort of a detail to make it look like a chimney stack or maybe a lighthouse with a slight taper. We'll see how it goes. So 
So I think I'll create a couple of little raised beads and then maybe do a little bit of texturing in the middle, something like that, uh, and just trim it down with a spindle gouge, producing uh, a bit of a flare at the bottom so it's uh, smaller at the top than it is at the bottom. And just to make my life easier, I've decided to use uh, the small beading tool, uh, which I don't use very often, but I've taken to using a bit more recently. Uh, because you can just gently go in, give it a little side-to-side -side movement, uh, and as long as it's sharp, you can get a neat little bead. Don't go in too far, though, because it'll take the top off if you're not careful. You've just got to get it to the point where the tool perfectly meets the top of the wood and you get a nice little rounded bead. A little bit of uh, dressing with the skew, just used as a scraper just to get into those little corners and sharpen them up. And then I thought I'd put a bit of a texture in the centre between those two beads with the crown small uh, texturing tool, uh, just to give me a, a little sort of collar detail. And then just define the area with um, a pointed tool just to sort of create a crisp edge. And then a quick sand up uh, all the way through the grits and taking care not to bang your fingers because you've still got quite a big lump of wood flying around. And then the end grain piece, uh, I blended it in to the shaft with uh, a bit of coarse uh, grip paper and then uh, sanded that by hand and also with uh, an electric uh, rotary uh, pad on the electric drill and then some chestnut sanding sealer uh, on it and that's gently then rubbed back and buffed in So it's around about now I realised my deliberate mistake that I hadn't actually worked out how to do the uh, second uh, tenon or mortise back on the original axis and of course at this point I haven't got any means of gripping it to do that. So I decided to just move the piece from the uh, chuck and stick it on the um, bench press and just uh, with a carbide tip 35mm um, drill bit, uh, forced a bit, just uh, drill a straight sided mortise uh, for the standard small to medium record power jaws that I've got that fit that. Uh, I haven't done a taper on it uh, but as long as it's uh, nice and sharp the um, record power small jaws will expand and grip the wood quite safely. It's about a 3 mil deep mortise. I'm sure there's a better way of doing this uh, that I'll have to think through separately. But anyway, I've now got a wobbly bit left on the bottom where the uh, mortise has uh, cut through the original tenon. So I have to pop that on the belt sander in a minute, otherwise it uh, won't sit neatly on the O'Donnell jaws. So that's been well tightened up and uh, centred so that it feels that it's uh, safely on the jaws. And now time to uh, reprofile the bottom part. You've got to watch your fingers again. And uh, try and do something to make the base look a little bit more interesting. I haven't really thought this through, I must admit, at this point. So it was kind of grab a half inch spindle gouge and see where you go. So I thought a bit of an undercut would work uh, just to give it a bit of a shape, making it kind of look like it's on a cliff edge. Uh, but as I was doing this, I thought, I know, I could probably get a captive ring on the bottom. Don't know why that has anything to do with the idea of this being a small weed pot vessel. But anyway, that's what I went on and started to do. 
So I've now shaped a reasonably prominent bead at this point and now grab hold of the bead forming tool which has got that little undercut nose so that you can just gently sweep that around underneath and doing it from both sides eventually you can part it off. It would have helped if I would got more clearance on the left and right of the tool. The shoulders uh, of that uh, cove that I cut are really a bit too steep and that was making access for the tool not as easy as it should have been. Another lesson learned. So I have to go back a couple of times with the small spindle gouge just to trim the, the sides and make it a bit easier to get in there. Final cut with the, uh, the tool just to just gently tease that uh, ring off without snapping it. Just a little final push and there she goes, she's starting to come loose. So I've just got to go in now with a small spindle gouge and dress the profile underneath the, uh, the ring just to make the ring a little bit more prominent and tidy it all up. So before sanding it all, uh, just going to uh, part down uh, part of the way on the headstock side so that I can get a good finish on the other side of the bottom. Uh, there'll be a nub left over as it's a mortise, you've got to be careful not to part it off and end up in fresh air, um, but that'll be power sanded off afterwards. some cellulose sanding sealer and um, part it off. I just buff the cellulose sealer up with uh, a bit of paper towel and then part it off. I decided that I'd wax it up afterwards. So there we have it, a bit of power sanding needed on the bottom and whatever planet I was on when I was thinking about making this, uh, it's done. It's quite unusual looking, I'm not exactly sure it's very elegant, uh, but it was a bit of fun. <laughs>